Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to talk about don't fight the Fed, monetary policy, and financial markets. So when you read financial news, you will always hear this kind of article. People always make this argument that don't fight the Fed. Okay. For example, I just get a bunch of articles from Wall Street Journal in this year. It say don't fight the Fed, balance sheet taper. And if you go back to last year, and they say. Don't fight the Fed in 2013,、uh, 2017. And if you actually go back to 20 years ago in 1998, they also say, "Don't fight the Fed." Okay, so what does that mean? And even in YouTube, we can find a song <laughs> called "Don't Fight the Fed." And you cannot see this clearly, but in the lyrics, it says, "I fought the Fed, and the Fed won." <laughs> Very sad story. But what do they mean, right? Why? What is this Fed doing, and why is it so scary that everyone is warning you don't fight the Fed? So let me go back to the, you know, the very basic question: What is the Fed, and what is Fed doing? Okay. So the Fed stands for the Federal Reserve, and essentially it is a central bank in the U.S. What they do? They set monetary policy. Essentially, set the level of interest rate. So here. I show the kind of a level of Fed fund rates, which is the main policy rate in the United States over time. So when the Federal Reserve feel that the economy is growing too fast, they will raise interest rate. As you have already learned in your corporate finance class, as interest rate go up, the cost of capital goes up, so people will stop investing, so the economy is going to slow down. And when they feel the economy is entering recession, they're going to lower interest rate, so people will start to invest, so the economy can recover. So, for example, in the recent financial crisis, the Federal Reserve lowers interest rate to almost zero, and this ultra easy monetary policy started the longest bull market in U.S. history. Right now, we're still in this bull market. So, because of this enormous impact. Of the Federal Reserve on the whole economy, and the Wall Street conclude that don't fight the Fed. Essentially, what they mean is that if you invest in a way that is aligned with the Federal Reserve's monetary policy, you're going to do well. However, if you fight the Fed, then you're going to do very poorly. And this is kind of the consensus in Wall Street. However, there's no consensus on what investors should do exactly. To invest along with the Fed, for example, what kind of assets should we buy or should we sell, and when should we do it? Right, there's no consensus about that. So this is where my research kicks in. So in my research agenda, I try to understand how monetary policy affect the financial market. So I'll give you one example. This is a recent research with my colleague Ken Daniel and Lorenzo Galapi. In this paper, we study. Monetary policy and a phenomenon called reaching for income. So in this paper, we go to the very basics of investing. So you have already learned this in your corporate finance class. Essentially, when you invest in assets, there are two ways you can earn return. One is to earn from current income; you get the dividends or you get the interest. The other way is to earn from capital gain; you have the price appreciation. Okay, and very. Two very smart researchers, both of them won Nobel Prize, Miller and Modigliani, tell us what investors really care is a total return, okay, the sum of these two, because money is fungible, so you don't really care about you know whether I get it through dividends or whether I get it through capital gain. So as long as I have a higher total return, as long as I have a low risk, right, I should buy all of this. So the trade-off is between total return and risk, and there's nothing about the dividend yields or the income of these assets. However, if you read, you know, what the financial advisor、uh, writes, you kind of get a very different picture. So you really recommend investors try to live off income and do not dip into your capital. So, for example, in Forbes, one of the financial advisor argued that the only dependable way to retire and to stay retired. Is to boost your payout so that you never have to touch your capital. Okay, so the idea is that it is more prudent just to consume the dividends and interest and not selling your assets. The kind of intuition is like the stock or the bonds is like a tree, and the dividends and the coupons are like fruits. 
it's more prudent to eat the fruits rather than selling the assets or chopping off the tree. So that's kind of their intuition. So our first question is whether investors are actually following this advice and you know, structure their consumption and portfolio holding in such a way. So what we do is we look into individual stock holding data. Essentially, we see when, what exactly portfolio held by each individual and at what time you know, they sell and buy these assets. And I follow this paper by Baker, Nagel, and Wergler to construct a marginal propensity to consume out of the income. So what do we do here? Let me show you this graph. So in the x-axis, we essentially plot the amount of dividends generated by each portfolio in each month. Right? For example, this dot means that in this month, this investor received 2% of their portfolio value of dividends. And in the y-axis, we plot the amount of money they withdraw from the portfolio as a measure of consumption. As you can see that there are two groups of investors out here. So one, of the, one group of investors, they are in the horizontal axis. We call them the non-withdrawers. Essentially, when they receive the dividends, they don't withdraw them. Right? So the withdrawal amount is zero. Essentially, they reinvest these dividends back to the portfolio. Okay? However, you see a different group of investors out there on the 45 degree line here. What they do is, when they receive the dividends, they withdraw almost one for one out of their portfolio for consumption. So this shows that there's a group of people indeed that try to live off their income, right? So they just consume out of the dividends. Remember, I mentioned there's other source you can earn return from holding assets, which is capital gain. So if I replace capital gain, I replace dividend yield with capital gain here, and you see an di entirely different picture. Essentially, what it say, say, say here is that no investor regularly withdraw their capital gain. So these two pictures just show that there's a good group of investors indeed trade dividend yield and capital gain differently. And there's a group of people try to live off their income. So what is the implication for monetary policy? So if investors do live off their current income, which means that they consume dividends and interest, then when low interest rate monetary policy depress the interest income generated by bonds, this investor may find that they their income cannot sustain their optimal level of consumption. So what they do, they can reach for income by buying more high dividend generating assets, like high dividend stocks. And this means that monetary policy may affect the portfolio choices of the investors as well as asset prices. And we call this the reaching for income hypothesis. So to test this idea, we look at the mutual fund flow data. So in this graph, what we plot is essentially the response of the fund flows to equity mutual funds to 1% reduction in the Fed fund rates. Remember, when the Fed lowers interest rate, it lowers its Fed fund rates. Okay? So the red line here is the inflows to the high income equity funds, whereas the blue line here is the inflows to the low income funds. And you can see that following 1% decrease in the Fed fund rates, we see persistent inflows to the high income funds and some inflows to the low income funds. But the magnitude is much larger for the high income funds. This is the direct evidence that investors do try to reach income. Okay? So if you look at bond funds and you see the opposite picture, when the Fed lowers interest rate, as our theory predicted, they rotate out of the bond funds. And moreover, they withdraw more from these low-income bond funds. So combining these two pictures, you really show that investors do reallocate their portfolios following the change of monetary policy. So what is the implication for asset prices? So our conjecture is that when the Fed lowers interest rate because it's this excess demand for high-dividend paying stocks, these high-dividend paying stocks can perform better than the low-dividend stocks. So what we do here is we separate all the stocks into 10 portfolios based on their dividend yields. So 10 here means these high dividend stocks, and one here is low dividend stocks. Let's first look at the red dot here. The red dot here is the excess return of those dividend portfolios when interest rate is declining. As you can see, when interest rate is declining, these high dividend stocks outperforms the low dividend stocks. Okay, so essentially consistent with our conjecture. 
what about when interest rates declining? That's the black line. When interest rate, sorry, when interest rate is declining, we see this red line, the high dividend stocks are going to outperform. When interest rate is rising, we see the opposite pattern. The high dividend stocks will underperform the low dividend paying stocks. Okay? And these patterns inform a trading strategy. We're going to buy those high dividend stocks when interest rate is declining because there's this excess demand from income seeking investors and short those low dividend stocks. And then reverse our portfolio where interest rate rising because this high dividend stocks are going to underperform, whereas the low dividend stocks are going to outperform. And this trading strategy is going to generate a cumulative return, which is this green line here, which is comparable to two of these most popular strategy out there, which is the high minus low and small minus big strategy. So what's the implication of this pattern? Firstly, we show that low interest rate monetary policy may lead investors to take excessive risk. Why is that? When the Fed lowers interest rate, bonds, which is relatively safer, becomes less attractive in terms of their income yield. Therefore, investors move their money to riskier assets like stocks, especially those high dividend stocks. And second implication is that the monetary policy may lead to capital reallocation between different firms, depending on their dividend payout policies. Specifically, when interest rate goes down, these high dividend companies, they will find that their stock price goes up, so it's relatively cheaper for them to raise capital than those low dividend firms. So to conclude, what we show here is that monetary policy have important ramification on the inner working of the financial market. And if you're an investor, if you have a corporate manager, you need to understand this implication of monetary policy. Don't fight the Fed, as the Wall Street mega usually tells you. But if you are the policymaker, which are determining what's the path of monetary policy, what you need to do is to understand this uh, investment's, uh, investor's behavior just to avoid those unintended consequences of setting interest rate too low or setting interest rate too high. Okay? So that is what I want to share with you. Thank you so much for your attention. Let's uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you.